Hey, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another video. This is a paid request, this time for Lucas. Thank you so much for that, man. And for those interested requesting pretty much any type of videos or topics, reactions, commentaries, what have you, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both things are down below in the info box. And Lucas wanted me to do a commentary and a review, but those will be separate videos. So first off is a commentary on the theatrical cut of the Fantastic Four from 2005, which I've never hated this film. I know a lot of people hate the film. Uh, I don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be. Hell. Uh, just to Alba, you know what, I used to trash her acting, and she's the weakest of the four, but I'll take her over Brie Larson and Jennifer Lawrence and... Who the hell was her name? So Gray forgot it. Yeah. I never hated this film. But I'm pause the beginning. Three, two, one, pressing play. But yeah, this came out in 2005. This is the, the heyday of one era of superheroes. We had X Men in 2000, X Men 2 in 2003. You had Spider Man come out around 2002 or so. Then you had Daredevil 2003, Hulk in 2003. You had Spider-Man 2, what, 2004, this in 2005, so it was a whole, it was a different era. And to be honest, a lot of those films I mentioned, like Daredevil and Hulk, The Punisher, 2004, I actually do like, and I gotta be honest, I like that era of superhero films more than this era. Sue me. These were just more fun, less political, and maybe because I didn't grow with Fantastic Four comics, uh, the only thing I knew of them is when, like, when Spider-Man was in an issue with them or such. But, I will guarantee this. This will be a better film than whatever the fuck Marvel, Ken Feige, whatever the hell they do with this new one. I guarantee you this will be better. I mark my words. And because of the cast. I like the guy, I always butcher his name, Ian Grufford, as Reed Richards. I think he does a good job playing... Reed, he's a guy that is a little bit nerdy, but he's still, you, you buy him as a leader of a group. Michael Chiklis is the best part of the movie as Ben Grimm. I may not love the suit that he wears as the Thane, but I think he has enough of the humor and heart that makes the Thane work. Um, I don't even mind Julie McMahon as Doctor Doom. He has that sort of slimy, sleazy way about him. And, uh, I mean, Tim Story is not the first or second or third choice I would choose. The Rider Lawn films, among others, being very subpar, but I honestly think this one is one of his, and I'm not a fan of the sequel, Rise of the Silver Surfer. I think that film is very below subpar, really lame film. Waste of the Silver Surfer character. Now this one seems like fairly faithful to the comic and how they get their powers and how the powers work as really like the dynamic of these four characters how they work together uh, make them feel like a family I think that was one of the best things about it and I'm sorry no I do not think that the Roger Corman film is better I know some people say that but I will say the thing looks better I'll give you that the thing looks better but the acting the, the lack of budget and effects, the everything about it is just really, really shitty. I'm, I'm sorry, I do not go with the whole, the Roger Corman, the cheap one was the best one. I do not agree one iota. I don't understand that. He's their own. I just think the acting, yes, even just Alba, Susan Storm, you know what? I would have cast someone else, but I've seen much worse. You know, her smile, the way she interacts with Reed Richards. There's a bit of warmth to her that I do not mind. And this bit of tension between she likes Reed Richards, but Reed Richards has his head stuck in a book. And... Each one has a little bits in between. 
General McMahon doesn't think much of Michael Chiklis' character. Like later on when he goes, why don't you just walk away? Reed and, and <laughs> what about his firstborn? Do you make the deal with the devil? Well, Susan Storm is with him, so I'll take that chance. <laughs> and Michael Chiklis, I haven't seen, I know, I guess he's done like TV work, because I was going to say, I haven't seen him in a while. The last film I remember him in was this really lame direct -to video film that I think Bruce Willis was in. I don't remember the title of it, <clears throat> but Michael Chiklis was a star. I guess that again, he's done some TV stuff. I think something called The Winning Season. I just I haven't seen it, so I can't comment. Of course, very famous for being in the TV show The Shield. Way back to the day, he played Belushi in the very controversial film Wired. <laughs> and we got Chris Evans. Well, before he became the other Marvel character, Captain America, he was Johnny Storm. And I thought Chris Evans did a great job in this as well. And Chris Evans, I I don't love him. And I'm oh, sorry, I like Michael Checklist. Can't do it. <laughs> Akete Or is from the underwear model. <laughs> I think it's like, how many times have I asked you? Five. They crash into a wall at a fly simulator. Five times. I thought it was four. Well, this is basically the fifth. <laughs> I mean, people go as corny as... I don't know. I just thought it's it has a fun f uh, family dynamic to to all these folks. Michael Tickless is the tough guy with a heart. <laughs> the way Chris Evans gives him shit. <laughs> the look on your hard ass former SEAL's face when he finds out he's your junior officer, priceless. <laughs> A lot of times this type of dynamic can work really well. I mean, you know, talk to the Ninja Turtles. You know, I mean, you just think of, you know, Chris Evans' character is Mighty and Michael Chiklis' character is Raphael. And they have that dynamic where, you know, this kind of bun of heads in a goofy, fun way. And one knows he can pick on the other because they'll get a reaction out of. And you have, of course, the leader, Reed Richards. And down until if he had tits, I guess, would be Susan, you know, Storm. <laughs> Which I thought he had in this new Turtles film, says he sounded like such a girl, but he's a boy, apparently. Just a five-year-old ready to wear diapers. Or probably still has diapers under his shell. Anyway, fuck that movie. <laughs> that, I mean, that, that stuff kills me. Like, that new movie of Ninja Turtles, you know, people talk about goofing on I wonder what Splinter's ass smells like does it smell like cheese and Doritos we talk about 30 pieces of milking and puking and people love that think it's a great movie but you know this is such an awful film for some reason just don't understand it so I don't get it this humor here is actually pertaining to the characters and not trying to be stupid shit the effects is maybe not always 
fantastic to use a pun, but it's 2005, different era of CGI special effects. So you're still doing all the heavy lifting. See, I like this little antagonistic bit between the future Doctor Doom and the thing. <laughs> he doesn't thought I'd do the walking. So take a walk. Of course, that comes in later on. When Doctor Doom makes a smart decision. He knows that the thing is the biggest obstacle and he tricks him into being cured. And it's like, well, well I took care of that outsmarting the the heroes but yeah Chris Evans this is a time when he was much more playing these type of jolty characters whether it be I did in this film even in Cellular which he starred in which I do like that movie of course he was Casey Jones in the 2007 Team and T film which, I mean, I still have issues with that film, but it does look better in age compared to what we see nowadays. That's something I read up, something about like Jesse Alba, like, I think this or the second film was like close to wanting to quit the business. I don't know what the reasons were, I don't know if it was the backlash or what the case may be. But like I said, compared to, you know, people nowadays, man, I'll take just your elbow over some of these fucking people nowadays. I really would. At least she's not fucking lecturing how men suck and all this other shit like fucking people nowadays do. I mean, she's no Meryl Streep and she's no Sigourney Weaver, but she's very beautiful and, again, I'll take over some of the shit today. Here the calculations are misguided and you think it's going to be hours but now it's minutes and this is where they don't get hit by this phenomenon and get their cosmic powers. I just imagine what the hell the, the new Fantastic Four will be. I'm sure it's going to get you, I'm sure people don't try to give it a pass because they looked at these films. But I mean, I don't know why people trust Marvel nowadays. I, I just don't see what is so awful about this movie. Yeah, four words. I said no, sir. I think Julian McMahon, he was in, I want to see the TV show Nip Tuck, which I never, never did see. <laughs> yeah, this is the solar flare, or however you want to put it. In a way, that's what he gets for his uh, selfish endeavor. They get these powers, and... Well, I mean, he gets powers, too, so... I think that was the, the difference they had. It was just the four of them. Here, they involved Doctor Doom as well. I mean, uh... How do you want to call it? Oh, 
your shit. And even when they get their powers, you see a little bit of their powers, like him extending Johnny a little bit of fire behind him, her at times disappearing. I thought this was a really funny joke. I do remember this. <clears throat> Where you, okay, you assume, and then it's just, I thought it was for a very funny scene. You're assuming that he's the thing, but of course, you come to find out that he's not. <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't be in a big Ninja Troll fan, I could see Mikey doing this to the Raphael and just... Or like the A-Team from back in the day, Murdoch doing this to B.A. Baracus. You thinking... <laughs> the Dodgers couldn't do anything to fix your face. <laughs> Bit of that gray street there. I like this little detail where he mentions quickly, no, she's allergic to those flowers to you know kind of showcase how much he he actually does care about this lady here. That's the thing, like, this guy here, which, uh, you know, I think the last time I saw him in was with San Andreas with The Rock. I think, sadly, with these actors, it, it well, obviously Chris Evans ultimately got with uh, Captain America. But, I think, sadly... Because of the bad reputation this film got, and then the sequel just being completely underperforming, uh, the third film got canceled, and these films kind of got lumped together as being uh, inferior product and silly and stupid and shitty and all this stuff. And to me, this is just like telling the origin story in a pretty succinct fashion. I mean, we're 17 minutes in, and we've gotten the inciting incident we have a feel of who each of the characters are how they relate to each other you know the smart ass Chris Evans character the Reed and Susan they're kinda they like each other but they don't go through it the antagonistic fun bit between Ben and Johnny <coughs> And these actors, especially like Chris Evans and Michael Chiklis, they're just so comfortable in their roles. You're hot. Why, thank you. So are you. Just rolling off the tongue. I thought one little detail they could have had is the thermometer melt. Or did it, and then it... Yeah, I think it could have been cool if yeah, she had like the thermometer like melt or something. I mean, I'd, great, he would have noticed, but See this right here, this is why I like the film, moments like this where it shows that Reed, like he's doubtful, he's confused, he's worried about the other people, he doesn't know what's going on, and Ben being the friend going, listen, it's a freak of nature, it's how it goes. <laughs> Maybe 
Maybe you should date him. <clears throat> I think it's just the way the characters interact with each other. I think it's a bit underrated. And I just, just see, I just feel the heart and warmth between the characters that again just to me gets way too much uh, shit in my opinion. Just my opinion though. Put that up a little bit. But yeah, it just gets way too much shit. So we got Johnny Snowborn in here. Makes sense. A guy in the cold who can be made of fire. That sort of contrasting difference between the two we're going to showcase. Maybe that's the thing. People felt there was too much humor. Which, I mean, hell, I mean, there's a lot of films that do that nowadays, and... They don't get called out as much as this film does. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of hard to try to showcase someone on fire while they're skiing. If it's actual fire, number one, it'd be very dangerous. Number two, the snow would take out the fire. So it's hard to showcase that as realistic as you can. This happens every day, you know. If you're on fire and you make a little sauna on your own, the other ladies just gonna be, yep, let's have a little hot tub fun right in the middle of the fucking snowy mountain. <laughs> Now, I'm sure if you read a lot of the Fantastic Four, there's a lot more to Doctor Doom show than showcase in the movie. So, if people were disappointed with that, maybe I can understand that. It's just I'm not that familiar with the comics, so I'm not... I'm not going to sit here and lie and say I'm a fucking expert. Like, not all people do, but I think there's some people that... I'm an expert and they read like two comics. <laughs> and Wiki Two comics and Wikipedia. We already know where this is going. <laughs> but yeah, I remember not minding this era of superhero films. I mean, I don't mind the first X-Men. I do like X-Men 2. The first Spider-Man, I don't think it holds up as well as some people think. Spider-Man 2 is pretty good, especially Alfred Molina's Doc Ock. I love The Punisher with Thomas Jane. I really like Daredevil, especially the director's cut. I like Ang Lee's The Hulk. I think that's a very interesting film. As I said, I thought this was just a fun movie. It's not a favorite of mine. It's not, you know, the top ten superhero films of all time. It's just... Yeah, I think the actors worked well.
I like the little detail that the earrings and the the thinner hair don't go invisible. Now, of course, the the stretch arms drawn type of arms. I mean, the CGI looks off. I don't know if you do ever do that and make you look quote realistic. It's a very hard thing to make someone arm, unless you somehow do it practically, which would be tough to do. <laughs> but yeah, that's the things that the Fantastic Four, at least the bits I've seen in cartoons read it seemed you know they were a family they were a family unit and with a family unit is that you know, dour and sour and super serious it just I guess people thought like this was too comedic and too goofy and then the 2015 film tried to go all the way opposite and People felt it was too serious and too unlike the source material and how dour. <clears throat> they just people thought, you know, have a happy medium. <laughs> Everywhere. I love the, just how excited Chris Evans' character is. I guess it makes sense. I mean, if you could turn into fire. It doesn't hurt you. I guess I'd be kind of excited too. Like, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> hey, 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 that brother sister angel. <laughs> What's wrong with you? God, what? <laughs> That's a funny uh, back and forth. Like I said, I think the actors just work well together. And that's the thing when you get the, the first film, it's always tough to have to go through the origin story. I mean, it's one thing if there's been like five films before, so you don't you don't have to go through the origin. But, you know, there was a Fantastic Four film that Roger Corman produced that never got officially released. So most people, especially by this time, had never seen it. So, technically for a lot of people, this wasn't the first time to see this, so... They have them showcase the powers, they have to learn how their powers work, they have to learn what about their situation, how do they get the name Fantastic Four, how do they work together as a team, how do they master their powers, how does Dr. Doom become a thing. You have all this build-up you have to do. I think that's what's disappointing about Rise of the Silver Surfer, is like you've done all this build-up, and it's a very just short, blasé forgettable movie that sequel Just find them, bitch. Like I said, I thought it, at least, I said it has a nice heart to it. Keep repeating that because it's something that gets overlooked nowadays, it seems. I don't know why. I just is looked at as cheesy or corny. God forbid. Part of what made films back in the day worth more of a shit. <laughs> I think you, you know he gets like the trench coat and the the hat fedora. I can't remember. I don't know if he had this type of uh, look, clothes wise in the comics. I remember if it's the sequel that he gets. Uh, I think it's the sequel where he gets the the blind girl who becomes his girlfriend. 
Like I said, Michael Tito just captured the, the, the warmth and humor of the character and also the, the tragedy of, you know, he's the one that can't turn his power off, so to speak. And, I mean, I actually like the fact that she... It's awful for her to do, but I feel it's a bit more realistic that you know, not everybody would do that, but there are some people that would react that way, and to show to you someone that does react that way, where, what the fuck are you? Fuck this shit, I'm gone. <laughs> and I think this is uh, Lori Holden, and I'm like, why does she look so familiar? Uh, she was in The Mist, and she was in Silent Hill. She was the cop. This lady here in blonde, Lori Holden, was the cop, and Silent Hill, the movie that is, the movie Silent Hill. Actually, it might be this one where he meets the the blind lady. It might be. I think later on in the film. Yeah, I think that's the case. Five point seven on IMDb. I'm sorry, that's way too low in my opinion. Like, what does Captain Marvel get? I'm curious. What does Captain Marvel get? You know, if you don't like the film, that's fine. But feel free to explain, actually, as to why. <laughs> 6.8. Captain Marvel gets a 6.8, but this has a 5.7. Okay. Now, yeah, a little, you know, stupid joke. At least there's no sound. Now, the suit, I do have issues with it. I think it's, but I think Michael Chiklis' performance helps overcome it. I think it's two things about this suit. Three things, actually. But first of all, I like this reaction. You think you got problems? Take a good look, pal. <laughs> I think what it is is one, the rock stuff feels. It feels like there should be a. It feels a bit too smooth. So I feel it, it looks a little bit more foam than rock. It looks more like a suit than someone made a rock. Number two, you don't have the eyebrows that the thing has. This is a pretty cool effect. Like, that looks really cool. You can tell it's a real truck. They, obviously, the real truck hits something, and then they put Ben Grimm, the thing, in there. Like, this stuff is all done for real, all done practical, which is such a hard thing to come by nowadays. But yeah, I think if you had like the eyebrows of the thing, which now you understand just how important that is to the look of the face. Also the eyes, it feels like the eyes, if around the eyes, like the inner workings of the eyes on here was finessed a bit, you put the eyebrows, it looked a little bit more rock, less foam. I think maybe it'd be a bit of a better suit. So yeah, I don't think the suit's that great. I mean, I think the suit in the Roger Corman produced one uh, looked better, but uh, his performance, from in my opinion, helps overcome it. <laughs> Sorry about the truck, pal. This is so wrong. Her getting her clothes off. There's her bra. Oh, shit. Ooh, shit. <laughs> I love Ree Richards' line. You've been working out. Nowadays, that'd be labeled fucking sexist or something. So apparently Justin Alba had a kidney infection during the filming and nearly fainted when she was with Julie McMahon in the space station scene. Damn. 
For most issues, Michael Chiklis was terribly uncomfortable in the suit. But the final street battle was in Vancouver, leaving Chiklis as the uncomfortable one of the four, while the rest had to be in skin tight blue uniforms. Michael Chiklis wore prosthetic teeth to prepare himself to speed with the prosthesis. Chiklis wore them when reading to his children. <laughs> Roger Chicklis was a devout fan of the Thane since childhood. He eagerly fought to have a real Thane rather than a computer generated character. He wore 60 pounds of latex, which took three hours to get into. The deep pool in the suit, a rock was removed from his head, and cold air was sprayed into the gap between the suit and the actor. Here we get each one showcasing their powers to help save the day here. A little bit of an early action scene. Many Tambo fans disliked the way Dr. Doom was portrayed. Paul Walker was deserved the part of Johnny Storm. During development, Chris Columbus pushed for the film to have a heavily comedic tone along the lines of the 60s Batman. Despite being hired because of his comedy background, Tim Story was able to persuade Columbus that going for an hour of comedic tone would end in disaster, and pointed the success of Spider-Man as proof that the film could still contain plenty of humor while having a generally serious overall storyline. Well, I gotta commend Tim Story for that. In the early 90s, burned Eichinger, his option on the rights to the film, were about to expire. To avoid this, he commissioned Roger Corman to make a film, the 1994 one, as quickly as possible so he could keep hold of the rights. This was mainly to thwart Chris Columbus, who was after the rights at the same time. Corman's version only cost $2 million. Neither him or his cast knew that the film was dumper-bound, as has always been seen in bootleg and download versions, with the general critical criticism being that it was a terrible movie. Which they are right. It is a terrible film. The screenplay had to be retooled after The Incredibles came out, as many of the latter's jokes were making fun of things that already existed in the 2005 Fantastic Four script. The action sequence of the Brooklyn Bridge was shot using a 200-foot set erected against a blue screen in a Vancouver parking lot, and then later enhanced with CGI views of Manhattan. In 2003, Peyton Reed, who will later do Ant-Man, pitched a Fantastic Four film to Fox, describing it as a hard day's night with superheroes. Alexis Denisoff as Reed Richards, Charlize Theron as Sue Storm, Paul Walker as Johnny Storm, John C. Riley as Ben Grimm, and Drew Law as Dr. Doom. A day after the film was released, the film was rebooted because Jessica Alba decided not to do another Fantastic Four film, and Chris Evans had moved on to play another Marvel comic book character, Captain America. George Clooney and Brendan Fraser were considered for the part of Mr. Fantastic. Ali Larder, Julia Stiles, Kate Bosworth, Rachel McAdams, Starla Johansson, Elizabeth Banks, and Trish Stratus were to serve for the role of Susan Storm. James Gandolfini and David Boreanaz, I fucked up his last name, he was the angel from the TV show, were to serve for the role of Ben Grimm. When Chris Columbus was attached, he wanted Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan to play Reed Richards and Sue Storm. Interesting. 
Marvel almost cast him in this as Robert Downey Jr. in this as Doctor Doom. This came out the same year as Elektra and Batman Begins. Tim Robbins was considered for Doctor Doom. <laughs> Where are your ears? <laughs> This was included in the first wave of Blu-ray releases by Fox. Five movies were included in this initial wave. Ice Age, Behind Enemy Lines, The Leader of Stormy Gentleman, Kiss of the Dragon, and this movie. Let's see. Sorry. Sorry, just uh, looking through this. The bird scene originally ended with Ben picked up Debbie's ring, but Michael Trick was improvised, not picked up the ring to make the part. Yeah, I mean, that was a nice detail, and then his friend had to do it. And that's where you get this another nice little close bit of friendship between the two, where Reed is, and you believe him. You believe him when he says, I'm going to do everything in my power to fix this. And yeah, I mean, I can see what people mean by the Julian McMahon, Dr. Doom stuff. It's, I don't mind the actor, it's just, Dr. Doom has this kind of image of being one of the great villains in comics, and that's not really showcased much at all in this movie. And you just say, yeah, the Fantastic Four to be are better portrayed, perhaps, than the, the villain here. Let's see. <laughs> Remember Wizard Magazine? Wizard Magazine was a comic kind of magazine. They would do like their wish cast on movies. So like in July 1986, they published who they would have in a Fantastic Four film. Some of these I've never heard of. Gail Old Grady as the Visible Woman. Mark Harmon as Mr. Fantastic, Dennis Franz as the Thing, Mark Paul Gossler from Saved by the Bell as the Human Torch, Jeremy Irons as Doctor Doom. I could see that, Jeremy Irons, Simon says. Uh, Marlon Brando as Galactus, Robert Patrick as Silver Surfer. Robert Patrick would have been pretty good. Helen Hunt as Alicia Masters, Jesse Ventura as Terax. And in December 2000, they had Ben Affleck as the Thing. Greta Paltrow as Invisible Woman, Matt Damon as the Human Torch, Jude Law as Mr. Fantastic, Wesley Snipes as Black Panther, Liam Neeson as Black Bolt, Angelina Jolie as Medusa, Pierce Brosnan as Namor the Submariner, that's a weird choice, Dustin Hoffman as the Mole Man, Ray Fiennes as Doctor Doom, Ah, there's Stan Lee, rest in peace Stan Lee. There was Stanley as the mailman, Willie. Apparently, they don't have the fantastic car in the film, but they just, you know, the budget and such didn't allow it. There was originally a long animated opening title sequence, but was cut to just the title. It was reinstated in the extended cut. 
so there you go. Let's see. Let's see. So I'm just looking over stuff. <laughs> Am I the only one that thinks this is cool? <laughs> of course, there's a little bit of the build up for the Fantastic Four headquarters, the Baxter building. So interesting, like okay, okay, we hire you to write all this shit down. In these newspapers that maybe people pause, they'll read. Let alone you know, make up all these you know fake pictures and stuff. Yeah, sorry I'm not saying anything. I'm trying to find any info about this. Uh, let me look at the Wikipedia page. Because a lot of this stuff is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, I don't really have much to say about the film. It kind of, the film kind of speaks for itself. Yeah, they talks about the Roger Corman version. The actors had no idea of the situation and instead believing they were creating a proper release. Marvel Comics paid in exchange for the film's negative. So it turns out Foster could go ahead with a big budget adaptation as well as a possible spinoff from film starring the Silver Surfer. Chris Columbus was hired in 1995. He stepped down as director, focused as a producer for Tessa Four under his 1492 Pictures Company. Peter Siegel was then hired to direct in 1997. He was replaced by Sam Weissman by the end of the year. In 1999, a deal was signed to extend the control of the film rights for another two years with a summer 2001 release. They hired Roger Gosnell, but he decided to do Scooby Doo instead, dropped out in October 2000. He was replaced by Peyton Reed in April 2001. Let's see. Tim Sir was signed and directed in April 2004. That made 56 million in its opening weekend. Made 330 million worldwide, 154 million coming from the U.S. But it got 28% Rotten Tomatoes. Marred by goofy attempts at wit, subpar acting, and bland storytelling, Fantastic Four is a mediocre attempt to bring Marvel's oldest hero team to the big screen. I 
Well, I mean, I agree. It's mostly character than plot. I do agree with that. I wouldn't say there's much of a plot. They get their powers. They learn how to control their powers. This guy becomes Dr. Doom. We need to stop him. But I did think it was a nice starting point for the, the film. I know a lot of people say the Rise of the Silver Server was better. I highly disagree. Highly disagree. Yeah, I know it's a short film. Like, if you take out the end credits, it's like an hour and 20-some minutes. But, I mean... I mean, it still got bad reviews regardless anyway. And that's why, you know, there's no third movie. So there you go. Of course, back in the day, you know, they when they showcase women, there's a lot of sex appeal. That's why almost every piece of clothing Susan Storm wears, you see a little bit of the the valley, so to speak, of the cleavage, which I appreciate. But I'm sure you know people would get very mad and upset about. But you know, we love the women. We love how they look. God forbid. God forbid. But you know. if the actress is comfortable, comfortable about it, of course. If she's not comfortable and they tricked her, then that's wrong. <laughs> I don't know, I didn't, because I didn't know much about the comic, so I don't mind the, uh, the actor playing Doom. Also, maybe you know, some people they were hoping to see more action. Because if it does, for I understand, they were the family that dealt with the cosmic threats. And I think the second film is much more disastrous, where Galactus is a fucking cloud, or whatever the fuck they did in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And a lot of scenes like this I don't mind being added because this is what would happen. They would see this person, people would just crowd into it, and it's like... <laughs> You damn well know so they don't steal them panties. You damn well know. <laughs> Johnny being a dick about it. <laughs> See stuff like this. I know it's silly and goofy, but I I do admit chuckling with it. little montage here <laughs> but it's like, okay, like what would they do with their powers and instead of just saving the world and stuff like their everyday life okay you best with your skin in order to shave you do all this other stuff I just love that sort of cheer, like, yeah! <laughs> I'd have to do a lot of like research to really get a feel of like who Doctor Doom really is in the comments and like what makes him tick and what what is quote the ideal version of Doctor Doom. Not just the costume, of course, but like what about his personality, his life, whatever that makes him tick to to make him a, a beloved villain. Cause one of those that just what really grabs me is the look of Doctor Doom in the the comments, but like I said, I haven't read a lot of stories featuring the guy. It was more like, oh, he's such a cool-looking villain. So it'd be nice to look into what more of a depth. If anyone who's a hardcore Doctor Doom fan, you let me know in the comments. Here. Of course, showcasing his ability to affect electricity among all that. Yeah, sure. Nothing personal. <laughs> Reference to Laveria, Laveria, where he is in the comets, pretty much a ruler of that area, that country. I thought this was pretty graphic, putting a big old hole in the guy's chest. Uh, yeah, I think that was pretty damn graphic <laughs> for uh, you know the rating this film got. Was it PG-13 or something? I think PG-13. I wasn't sure it was that or PG. Um, okay, yeah, probably PG-13, yeah. Well, if you're wondering, this is the extended cut. I mean, it's 
it's the extended edition that has both cuts of the film. I'm watching the theatrical. There's also the extended version, which I can't remember all the differences between the two. You have a commentary with three of the stars, just to Alba, Michael Chiklis, and Ian Grufford. You have another commentary where Tim Story produces Avi Arad and Kevin F Kevin Feige. There you go. Screenwriters Michael France and Mark Frost. Extended deleted scenes. Rise of Silver Surfer trailer. Silver Surfer featurette. Heroes are born. The Make the Fantastic Four documentary. The Bachelor Building declassified featurette. The World's Greatest Comic Magazine documentary. Jack Kirby Storyteller documentary. Visiting the Stately Ross Museum featurette. From comic book to film featurette. So pre-packed stuff in this DVD set. Two discs. I don't know if all this is in the Blu-ray. I find enough this still has the ticket to go. Well, not well. Yeah, in a way, ticket. If you were at these theaters, to still see Rise of the Silver Surfer. As John is going to showcase a bit more oomph to this motocross. But, so this is what it's redeemed for Fantastic Four Rise of Silver Surfer. These complimentary certificates are accepted virtually everywhere nationwide. Log on to a find a participating theater near you. Hollywood movie money. Theater endorsed here. And then in Thieves, June 15, 2007. So I guess if you bought the DVD, you get a ticket to Rise of the which obviously I didn't use. <laughs> and apparently not a lot of other people did too. So there's also advertisements for other films around that time that were coming out for DVD. Daredevil Director's Cup, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Elektra, and AVP. Daredevil, I definitely think, is the better film, especially Director's Cut. Some older films, Dire Collection, Man on Fire, Day After Tomorrow, and I, Robot. All films I like, although Day After Tomorrow is the weakest of these. And then, say $5 on the purchase of any more Fantastic Four Marvel order. Here we got the car, the showcase of Ben, the sequel, and then, fuck is this, Slurpee, 7-Eleven. I never grew up around 7-Eleven. I know what it is, of course, but I've never been into a 7-Eleven because they just weren't around when I grew up, so. And then the extended cut little pamphlet. Well, it's the edition, I keep saying because this has both cuts, which is nice. Lo and behold, set that has both cuts of a film. I love that. I love him putting his fucking car into a ball. Love well, the way that looks too. Like how they made that work with it. It does look like a car put into a ball. Because of advertisements, Burger King. Well, I mean, it makes sense with the event they have. There would be advertisement around Pepsi. So be. Plus, on the flip side, you get some advertisement for the movie. And yeah, I do prefer that it is a practical suit. It's not the best looking suit, but I do prefer, other than it was just a CGI thing. <laughs> I said, take the bell, you want to fly? Then fly. That's the thing, I think it's the eyes around the thing that look a bit too human or something like that nature. <laughs> I 
I say I like the relationship between the, these four. You have the the brother sister mentality between Johnny and Sue. You have the the friends that are kind of drifting apart because of the events like Reed and Ben. <laughs> like didn't girls are making money? Is there any higher? <laughs> well, Johnny, that's easy for you to say. You have no idea what I do, what I give to be invisible. And that's another reason why I think this film works. Michael Chiklis, I think, of all of the versions, really got what the thing was. And you tell Chiklis was a big fan of this character, and he put a lot into this character. You just care, you just tell that he just truly cared. And that helps a lot in a film like this. That's sincerity to it. And yeah, the plot is second nature to the characters. So as the, I'm not gonna say this like one of the greatest, you know, it's up there with Superman the movie and Batman eighty nine. No, but I think it was a fun, good first step. The sequel to me is where it dropped the ball. Oh yeah, this is where he meets the the blind lady. To me, I wouldn't be scared. I'd be like, oh, cool. How's it going? I definitely wouldn't be laughing. I like this bartender, though. <laughs> I thought this is a nice scene. Talk about rock hard abs. <laughs> What was the line she says? Sadness or something she sees? Ah, so sad. And I liked the, this girl. Actress did a good job. Liked her attitude. That was a nice, sweet scene. <laughs> good looking lady, too. <clears throat> I don't know why the hell this would be a present and wrecked it, you know. A recognition for humanitarian and it's a metal mast. I don't really get the how the hell that's the case, but yeah, I mean honestly I wouldn't say just to Elba is the the weakest part as I'm watching this again. I would say okay, she's maybe the weakest actor, but she does fine. Like she does fine. It's just the way the villain, Doctor Tomb on one hand, I did what they were going for, though. 
that he has a personal relationship with these characters. But, so that's how he could become, you know, an, an actual threat. But that's how he gets his powers. Which I don't even know if that's, you know, I said, shows how little I know about Dr. Doom. <clears throat> Like I said, I don't mind the performance being this like sinister, slimy type of guy. <laughs> like I said, I'm sure there's a lot of people nowadays that are just itching for action. Like, where's the action? I mean, what you've gotten so far is hour and ten minutes. There's, you know, 35 minutes left. That's what the end credits. You have the bridge sequence and then you have the the little teeny bit between Johnny and Ben Grimm but basically then what people would say like we want more character work than action but then the film does that it gets penalized for it now for understanding this scene these two were in completely different countries they were not in the same scene together that's why I shot like this, where over the shoulder on one, over the shoulder the other. And that they're actually in two different places, and they had to be edited together. So they like to stand in for Sue Storm. <laughs> Strong in man. Now, there's a deleted scene where actually he kind of makes to look like Wolverine. Hugh Jabman and Wolverine, but they cut that out. Maybe they felt that was a bit too on the nose or something of that nature. But it's one of those things like if the film franchise was more successful, like if the third film went Game Busters, maybe, maybe there would have been some team up between Fantastic Four and Wolver and uh, X Men since same company Fox. So. Putting those doubts into Ben Grimm's psychology, trying to twist in the, the little edges and twisting the screws in, twisting the screws in deeper and deeper. The one time he goes out, that's where Doc. Again, you see a bit of his planning. You know, trying to aid him on all this stuff. <laughs> Those are like flip them and <laughs> Yeah, you know, I love that bit where you try to flip them over, just goes back. Like no matter how you do this is always gonna look weird and wanty. Like to have a person look like he's made of rubber. It's always going to look funky. I think it's always going to look somewhat ridiculous. But I think they did the best they could in 2005. And for people who say that this is just comedy from beginning to the end, this is a serious moment.
Like you, you understand Ben's frustration of being this freak. Him feeling guilt for not getting the time right from hours to minutes. <laughs> I love this. I love Chris Evans' reaction to this. It's kind of, it's catchy, right? <laughs> That was the prototype. <laughs> and that's where he gets the phrase is clobbering time. Him trying to put a catchphrase into a toy. But like I said, Chris Evans was playing this type of character a lot around this time period. Like you had, like I said, a little bit of Casey Jones and Team NT 2007. Chris Evans had a bit of that in it. Like I said, there was the film Cellular, which is an underrated film. Jason Statham was the villain. Chris Evans was his guy that got this, uh, was able to, got a phone call from Tim Baxter who was kidnapped. And... Pretty good thriller, cellular. Won't go too deep into it. It's worth a watch if you like the the cast and you looked up the trailer if you like the trailer. The Losers. He was in that film with Jeffrey D. Morgan and I think Idris Elba was in that. That's another good one. The Losers, underrated one. But then you know Captain America came about and there you go. But also, yeah, I kind of don't mind like him knowing the, these group of characters because Doctor Doom, that is, because he would know that Ben Grimm would be, you know, frustrated with what's going on. That Reed Richards would want to push this experiment forward. Either it worked and he could cure himself, or it didn't, and this guy's out of the way. Oh, and he's watching as well. <clears throat> so I guess he doesn't really want to tear. It's just him get this guy out of the way. Because he knows, like, Reed Richards is a bit fucked up. Now, do you think of Dr. Doom's point of view? Johnny Storm just wants to do whatever the fuck he wants. Reed Richards is a bit fucked up. Sue Storm, he still wants and love how he want to put it. So the one obstacle for him is this guy. So. <laughs> Tear him. And it makes for an interesting dynamic where Michael Chiklis has this choice where he could be, you know, human and not a freak, but he has to make the heroic choice of becoming that again now granted if you went to that machine who's to know that you would have the exact same thing I mean he could have had one you know Johnny's powers he could have had Reed Richards powers I mean what makes it that each time he goes in the storm you get this specific power or freak it what I mean what if he went in this machine and had the power of just healing, like Wolverine, or whatever the fuck. I guess, you know. But, you know, how, do, how the fuck do you explain the comics? How the fuck do you explain at all of why do you change in one way or shape or form? It's science fiction. Either go along with it or you don't. Uh, his power is electrical power to bring the power levels up. <laughs> okay. 
Now, you would think, okay, he tears Ben Grimm that maybe... Hey, now we're going to be best friends and he's going to use him a bit more to fuck around with people. But at least it's an evil sinister plan known a bit early, I guess. <coughs> I think the surprise that what, it worked? <laughs> Oh yeah, he knows it worked. <coughs> yep, that's where he gets it. But like I said, I like his voice. I think Julian McMahon has the right voice for Doctor Doom. <laughs> Ooh, shit. Oh shit. <laughs> I said that effect doesn't look the best, and again, I don't know how you could get that effect to work prominently and looking good. Very again, how to make a person look like rubber it is a very tough endeavor. Oh shit, good stunt from that person. That's a real life person going through that fucking thing. That's a good stunt. Congrats on the stunt man there. the the mask <clears throat> and you know what I actually don't mind the 2015 Fantastic Four either so you know people that get mad and say that well you'll you don't like what these are different well I mean I don't mind this film and I don't mind the 2015 film of Fantastic Four and those are pretty different versions But yeah, it also gets to the point, what are you a fan of? What are you... Ah, <laughs> oh, there you go. I do think that's a cool looking Doctor Doom look. And that's the thing, like in a proper sequel you could really further showcase this character, but they did not do that. 
in my opinion. <laughs> it's a big fucking rocket. <laughs> Don't anything about it, never do. <laughs> uh, we have the flame on. <laughs> I remember there's that rumor, what was it, for Doctor Strange 2 or something, that there was going to be this multiverse thing where, oh, you don't have Chris Evans back, but he's going to be Johnny Storm. Here it gets to the uh, the choice. What do you do? It means the self sacrifice from his looks to to save his family. Oh shit! I do like the look of the the Human Torch. I always thought it was such a cool looking character in the comics and stuff. Especially like when there would be like him and Spider-Man and some of their team-ups. And you can like shoot fireballs and stuff. There you go. I always thought that looked really cool. I didn't... The, that's the tough thing with the Fantastic Four is a lot of them are just tough effects to showcase. You have the thing that has to be an effect 24-7, as in any type you see him. The Invisible Woman, to make it not seem like, okay, just there's just nothing there. So you have to make it invisible, but some kind of, like here you see a bit of reflection, like it was the Predator, light, ref light refracted. You know, how do you make someone look like they're on fire and make it look realistic? Because if someone on fire including their face, they're going to get burned and die. And you know, how do you make someone look rubbery? Susan, let's not fight. Kind of shows that Invisible Woman's powers are kind of useless compared to the other folks. <laughs> now that's a crowd pleasing scene. It's clobbering time. It makes sense because the last pre the previous line was did you say goodbye to Johnny? So he's thinking of Johnny Storm. Johnny Storm had this toy. <clears throat> yeah, that little bit of antagonism between Ben and Doom before. Now it is this fight here. <laughs> Through the bottom of the fucking pool. There you go. <laughs> well, this is a pretty well staged sequence. You know, for Tim's story that's not really used to do, doing this kind of thing. It's not that badly sta stage of an action sequence. And it's like, okay, we have a budget. It's still a big budget, but at the same time... Let's not destroy an entire fucking city. It's like, okay, here's a block. We don't utilize as much practical as possible. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. Do you stop the car? <laughs> okay, sh we want to do as much practical as possible so it'll hold up. 
showcase one block and okay we got real cars flipping around with all this other stuff happening <laughs> wow that's a cool effect having that car flip and the bus the way it's sliding that's really cool to look at and all done for real in camera doesn't look like just a fucking CGI video game like a lot of stuff like some of the stuff in Shang-Chi or the Eternals or other shit and Doctor Doom you yeah, don't just get all the hits on me, I'm gonna do some stuff to you too. <laughs> there you go, there's the invisible woman. <laughs> you miss me. There we go. Fantastic Four versus Doctor Doom. <laughs> and I'll show you as they work together. Like I said I think it works well for a first movie. And try to okay, what are we going to do in the sequels? I didn't like to say that's when they fucked up. <laughs> I like that they roll in a circle and then like be a tapestry above them. And that's the thing when you have four against one, like how long do you make the battle to make, not make it seem like, well, damn, if it takes as long to take out this guy, then what the hell in the future could it be to take out any of these other cosmic wonders, you know, Galactus, all this other stuff. So it can't go on too long, otherwise, well, fuck, if it takes as long for this one guy, what else? But you don't want to be too short to shortchange the audience either. And that's what I mean, like, all the villains and all the people you could detail in sequels is just a fucking Galactus as a fucking cloud? That's the best you got? And then Silver Surfer, is not really a villain? And Just feels like, I mean, obviously they did that because Silver Surfer, people know that character. I mean, it's in the fucking title they put it in. Probably also hoping to have a Silver Surfer movie, which that never came about. And I just. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> now, of course, I mean, now that we've shown that we could cure the guy. I don't think Ben Grimm would have stayed as this creature. It's one thing to do it and then save them, but now that he's saved that and done that, I think he would have turned back into human. And that's the, that is the issue when you bring up that idea that you could cure the guy and the machinery is there. 
I don't buy that he's like, nah, I'll stick with this. I mean, Ray, you could go into that accepting who you are, but at the same time, if it's such an easy fix, as it seems. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know how uh, the whole sex thing would work between you two. I mean, if everything is rocky, so to speak, I don't know. Well, I don't know. There's some TT women out there. So there is that. They use these toys with these big... Never mind. I do like this little bit where he kneels down about the same time. It's like, oh, there's the rest of his body. <laughs> These little touches that, you know, just add into their powers, that just used for action sequences. Like, what will you do with these powers in your everyday life? There's a little bit of nice touches here and there. Nice sweet bit of business there. Although you can tell that the background's, you know, it's very CGI. Four symbol in the sky there. Yeah, then I think you get a little bit with Doctor Doom going Laveria, sort of a what might possibly happen for a sequel, or doesn't just have to be the second one. It could be third, fourth, uh, however many that you make. Of course, you know you couldn't take out Dr. Doom that easily. But yeah, Sally's for Rise of the Silver Surfer, which to me is the lame one. It's a pretty bad movie. This one, not so much. I mean, I just watch it again. It's not that bad of a film. I don't really see this Laveria going home. I just don't see the, the bad, terrible, awful movie that people said it was. I just don't. That's just me, though. Like I said, I don't remember all the differences between the different cuts of the film. I don't. I mean, you guys can look. There are plenty of websites that do comparisons between the two. Uh, you know what's in this you know. movie censorship is a good website for that but yeah overall what makes the film work the best is the the chemistry between the the two uh, the, the four cast members So again, yeah, I don't know all the differences between the stuff, but I'm flipping through it right now. Yeah, the opening has a little bit of, I mean, they say animated, it's a little, but it's not like cartoon, 
not that type of animated. It's a little bit like comic panels in a way, comic book panels. Like I said, I can't really tell you what all the different, like I said. I'm flipping through it, and there, probably, and there might be like a lot of little details kind of put into throughout the film. Anyway, that's Fantastic Four 2005. Uh, I'll do a review as soon as I can, Lucas. And with that said, thanks for watching. Take care, and we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.